So let's see this in action. We're going to be looking for x-intercepts. We're going to do it through the table. So we want to find the real zeros of each of these functions. So we have this function x cubed plus 2x squared minus 5x minus 6. And this is given in this table format. So if we look at the table here, we want to see where are the zeros or where are the x-intercepts. Well, the x-intercepts are where y is 0. So we're looking at this guy here. That's where the y is 0. y is equal to 0. So that's where the zeros are, or that's where the x-intercept is. Um, so let's make kind of a, a table off of this. So the zeros, sort of just adding new rows here. The zeros here are x equals negative 3. That's one of them. Now we're also looking for where y is 0. A y is also 0 here. So that means we have the 0, x is equal to negative 1. And then we're looking for where else y is 0. So we have y is 0 right here. So that is a 0 of x equals 2. So those are the zeros. So then the corresponding factors using that rule, that relationship that we wrote above, is that if x equals negative 3 is a 0, then x minus r, and so we're essentially just swapping the sign, is a factor. So that means that x plus 3 is a factor. And then if x equals negative 1 is a 0, then that means that x plus 1 is a factor. If x equals 2 is a 0, then that means x minus 2 is a factor. And so this is actually a very nice way of factoring higher degree polynomials. Because what this is saying is that once we have the zeros, we can factor a polynomial. So we started with this polynomial y equals x cubed plus 2x squared minus 5x minus 6. That's what we started with up here, right? That was the original equation. And we can actually factor this 2x plus 3 times x plus 1 times x minus 2. So that is actually a very, very powerful tool in factoring polynomials. And we didn't have to do factor by grouping. We didn't have to find what times this is, is added to that. Well, those are good factoring techniques or methods. We could just factor it by looking at the zeros or finding where the x-intercepts are. So let's take a look at this next one. We have x cubed plus 3x squared minus 4x minus 12. And we want to look at and identify where these zeros are, or where is the y zero. So the y is zero at here, and here, and here. So that's where we see where all the y's are zero. And we have, we'll make the same table and format. So we have zeros listed out here. So this is giving us that x equals negative 3 is a zero. This is giving us that x equals negative 2 is a 0. And this is giving us that x equals 2 is a 0. And so what that means is that the factors of each of these are just the x plus or minus the r's, or in particular, x minus r. It's the opposite sign. So this is x plus 3 is the factor because it's the opposite sign x plus 2 is the factor because it's the opposite sign. And then x minus 2 is the factor. So we could factor this polynomial where it is y is equal to x cubed plus 3x squared minus 4x minus 12. We could factor this as x plus 3 times x plus 2 times x minus 2. And so notice here that the degree on this polynomial is 3. The degree on this polynomial is 3. And then the number of zeros, we found 3 real zeros. And then over here, we also found three 
real zeros. And so let's take a look at some of these other ones. We should expect to find three real zeros or four real zeros on, on some of these other ones. But let's see actually how many we really do find. So looking at this table, we see uh, y is zero there, or p of x is zero there. And that's good. That means what we have here is that we have x equals negative one is a zero. So we have the table or the list here, the zeros is x equals negative one. Um, but we don't see anywhere else that y is zero, the output is zero. So the question is, does that mean there's just one zero or are there more zeros? Or how do we find these other zeros? And in particular, we can look at this function, there are more zeros. So if we look at the y values and how they're changing, notice that from negative eight here to one, think about what's happening to the y values. And what's happening to the y values is if we go from negative eight to one, and we're assuming this graph is continuous, that means that this graph had to cross zero at some point. So that means that there actually is a zero in between here, or there's an x intercept here. So there should be a zero here. We don't know exactly what that zero is, but there should be one there because the, the y values need to cross zero. And then, if we think about that same reasoning, okay, went from negative to positive, where else may that have happened? Uh, okay, it goes to zero here, it's all negative, negative, and then now it's positive. So in between the zeros of, or in between the x values of two and three, we have that there should be a zero here because the y values go from negative three to 16. That means that it had to cross zero at some point. So there should also be a zero here. We don't know exactly what it is. We know that it's between two and three and the other zero is between negative three and negative two, but we don't know exactly what it is. And here we're just assuming that the graph is now gonna go up to infinity forever. It's just gonna keep increasing. And so we can identify some of the zeros where they are. There's only one that we know we have in hand. And then on this, other one as well. So first off, this one was degree three. So we, we expected three zeros. We actually did find three zeros. We just didn't say exactly what they were. And now on this other one, negative x to the four plus three x squared minus four x minus five, we can look at the degree here is four. So this is degree four. So that's what we expect uh, the number of zeros to be, or at least the maximum number of zeros. So let's take a look and see, can we identify any zeros? Well, just right off the bat, there's no y values of zero that we see. So we're gonna have to look between the lines here. So we wanna see what's happening here on the left-hand side, and this is an even function. So when it goes you know, this way, it's actually gonna to go to negative infinity because this is opening down because we have this negative here. That leading coefficient is negative. So it's opening down. So it's both gonna be going down to negative infinity on the left and right hand sides. And then we wanna see where might there be a zero or where do we cross the x axis? So we cross the x axis let's see, negative 47, negative one, and then we get to one. So that means we go from negative one to one, which means that we have to cross or pass zero at some point there. So there is also a zero here. Again, we don't know exactly what it is. We know it's between negative two and negative one. And then we see where else is there a potential zero or a change in the sign. Oh, we go from one to negative five right here. So that means that there should also be a zero here. And then we don't see any other changing of the signs. We don't see any places where it could cross the X axis because it just goes negative and it stays negative. So here on this, 
on this one, we found only two real zeros. On the other one, we actually did find three real zeros. But since the degree is four, well, earlier we said that the degree tells us the maximum number of zeros. So if there are two real zeros, then the other zeros have to be somewhere, but they're actually two imaginary zeros. And we'll talk more about how we find those and what those look like. Now let's take a look at this last one here. This is again, degree is four. And so if the degree is four here, we should maybe find at most four zeros. So let's take a look where there are some sign changes. And, and in fact, since this is a degree four, it's even, we can talk about some of these end behaviors. This is gonna be opening in the same direction on the left and right hand sides. That's what even functions or even degree functions do. So this is gonna be opening up because it's positive out front here. So this is going to positive infinity on the left-hand side and positive infinity on the right-hand side. And so we can look, where do we see the sign change? So it comes you know, from positive infinity, it's, it's decreasing, 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 and then it becomes negative right here. It goes from one to negative three, so that means there's a zero here, somewhere in between zero and one. We don't know exactly what it is. It could be one half, it could be two thirds. Um, and then the next one we wanna see, are there any sign changes again? Okay, it's negative, 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 negative. Um, oh, it's positive here. So that means that we have another sign change. So it must have gone from you know the bottom half of the graph to the top half of the graph, which means you have to cross the X axis. So we have a zero here. And that's all that we can identify because we just assume it's going to go up to positive infinity after that. So we have two real zeros. And then there should be two more. So there's probably two imaginary zeros somewhere. So what's happening here is actually a very important result that we have in math. And part of it is saying or just describing what we did here and looking at oh, there should be a zero here, there should be a zero there. So on some of these tables, in particular on example A here, it doesn't show all the x-intercepts because the x-intercepts are not all integers. We do have one x-intercept that's an integer, which is the negative one. However, because the table is written as integers or like nice numbers right negative three negative two negative one that those are how we count in the table we don't see the other zeros which are not integers but we can still tell where they are like on the first one we know it has to be between x is equal to negative three and negative two and also it has to be between positive two and, and positive three because the y values changed signs. It went from negative to positive and then the other one it went from negative positive again. And so because you go from negative positive, this is actually what we call the intermediate value theorem, which essentially says if you have a continuous function that goes from one y value to another y value, then it must cross all the other y values between those. So simply put, if you change signs somewhere, you must pass the x-axis, but don't pass go and don't collect $200. Um, so this is what's called the intermediate value theorem. And essentially in our case, if we go from like positive negative or negative to positive, then that means uh, we have the, the zero there. So we're looking for the zeros where the y values change signs. And so we actually were mentioning it on the previous two examples with B and C. We had degree four and we identified two real zeros where there were those two sign changes from positive to negative or from negative to positive. However, the degree was four, so there should really be four total zeros. So if there are 
two real zeros, then the remaining two zeros must be imaginary. Which tells us, and we'll look more at the imaginary zeros next time, but when we have an imaginary zero, they come in what's called conjugate pairs. And the reason being for that is because we find these imaginary zeros. Let's say that we have the factor x squared plus 4. We're looking at this factor here. If we were to solve this x value for 0, what happens is we subtract 4 on both sides. And then we have x squared is equal to negative 4. And then we apply a square root on both sides. But whenever we apply the square root on both sides, what really happens is that, let's give us some more space here so I can write this out. x squared is equal to that. So we applied the square root so that we could do algebra, right? We could solve this solution. But what happens when we do that is we have two solutions. We have a positive and a negative. So we can get a positive and negative imaginary number. So remember imaginary numbers, we define it to be i, where i is equal to the square root of negative 1. And then we'll talk later about all the different rules about imaginary numbers, but essentially, if i is the square root of negative 1, then we can rewrite the square root of negative 4 as x is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 4 is... Well, two, but it's not just two because you have a negative number in there. We always say you can't have a square root of a negative number. But when you do have a square root of a negative number, we use the i to identify that, the imaginary number, which means we have two times i here. So that's why there's two solutions here. They always come in pairs because if you have one imaginary number, you get that from square rooting. And when you square root, you get two possible solutions. So we have two i and negative 2i are these two solutions or these two imaginary numbers in this particular instance of what we started with.